Alice. Hi, hello Helen, I'm Frank. And Frank, when and where were you born? I was born in 1928, down in Minster, Kent, in the workhouse there. That's where my life started. Why were you born in the workhouse? I was born in the workhouse in 1928. And living in the workhouse is because your mother can't afford to keep you. And the mother was in the workhouse as well. So parents had to go in because they couldn't keep and pay the way in the, in the country themselves with the jobs and everything. And many, many, many people were also in the workhouses in days. They were very sad places to go to. And what were the conditions like in the workhouse? As a, as a boy, you just accept everything. But I do remember when I was in a cot, and you're all born in the same ward, and your mother can only come and see you once a week, and they have a maid from there to look after the children, because a lot of children were in the workhouse as well as pe grown up people. And to me, to see and grow up in there as a boy, a baby, you start to see things, and they're not very pleasant because they're sad, because we don't know the outside world, and you have to obey by order everything what you have to do. And what was sad about being in the workhouse? Sad being in the workhouse. When you start to get to about the age of five, you took out outside the, the hospital where we was in. And then you're pushed around in the workhouse itself. And the sad thing is you see your mothers and fathers and your older children, disabled people as well, all have to work for being there for their keep. They have to scrub and make the beds for children, for the basset, their children. They had to do the laundries, the working people. And unless you've been in one, no one realises just how sad they are. It's part of life, but it's the only way that they could keep, the, keep us children as well. So people who lost their husbands or mothers and they never couldn't pay the rents at home and they were too able, too sick to be in. They had them in as well too sick to carry on so they put them in workhouses and a lot of people in civilian life never liked them that the name of the workhouse because it was a poor lord's um, place to go to where poor people went like myself and my mother and it is so sad because you see people crying you know and not only that you see the crying and everything else that uh, you have to live with it and then when you when you get older, you will be transferred to the boys and girls, who are a bit older then, to a new workhouse home for children. And it's only run by a house mother and all the children. The girls will be in one part of the homes, children's home, and the boys will be in the other. And all of them have to clean the toilets, to make the beds, polish floors, with the bumpers and everything like that. And when I got up to 11, you remember all them things and I've never forgot them. You just can't. They are sad, but there's happy times. Christmas time, the RAF used to come, the Manston RAF used to come and make toys and bring them. They used to give us a concert at night on the Christmas time. And one thing I always remembered was um, Jack in the Bean store. Now, I don't know if you ever go to the Hippodrugs and all that. I don't know if you've ever seen that, have you? Yeah. Well, that's really lovely, isn't it? Because I used to get scared when the big flash went, did it go? Yeah, and of course they, they're coming down the road. <laughs> but when you're children, you see that, you don't have time to see how they did it. But it made you laugh. But you see, you had your happy times. And the children helped one another they're in their homes. Because they some disabled, very deformed. But you never took, your, uh, never took it out of them. And that's one thing we had children respect one another. And if the mothers and fathers wasn't there, or they wasn't got no mother and fathers at all, we would share our sweets when our mothers come, or fathers come. But sometimes, I only saw my wife, my mother, for at least only five times in 11 years that I was in there. And that's, to me, was a bit sad when she come. Because children always used to say, Mummy, when you're coming back, Daddy. When you're coming to see us again, they couldn't tell you. Because we never see them from one year to the other, you see. It's so sad. Did they punish you at all in the workhouse? Uh, the punishment they gave you was not just being we're going up and clouting and all that sort of thing. The punishment was giving you extra work to do. 
and no matter what you do, what you did, and I caught stealing the, the uh, jam out of the pantry. Now, to steal the jam out of the pantry with your finger is a crime, and you pay that crime by walking into the middle room with the house mother, going through where all the boys were, and you're sent to bed that evening earlier than you normally go. But the point is, you know you do wrong, but there was no brutality. That's one thing about it. You was disciplined to behave and do as you're told. And a lot of them did do the same things or played around and breaking toys and that sort of thing. But we shared toys as well. And that was lovely because the Royal Air Force bought some. And I believe the corporation did a lot for the children's home there. It was well looked after by all the people in the village and the schools. When we used to go to school, you were an outsider but no one would ever pick, pick on you. That was the nicest thing about him. But you never really knew the outsiders. And when I used to be inside the workhouse, I'd be looking out the window, see if my mother was coming. Or I'd be looking to see the boys, that was outsiders, going past the iron railings gate. And they'd be playing around and go, well, we had to march all the way down together, like they do in an army. We, had, we couldn't run free to go free down to school. And it seemed a shame that we didn't know what it was like to live out, to be living outside the Jordan zone, free with your mother and father, you know. So it, it's, uh, it hurts and makes you cry sometimes. Sometimes I've cried many times, you know, and a lot of others as well. But the workhouse was like that. And at what age did you attend the local village school and what was it like? It was very good, really, but you've got to learn. Now, I, I was sort of more upset in my mind than the feelings of being in that workhouse where my mother was, that it was like a, a very deep impression you never get. I was hard to, to be taught. And the funny thing is that I could write perfectly when I saw the school teachers write on the, their blackboards. They were really good when they write. No scribble with the teacher. And when I used to do it, it was very neat myself, but I couldn't spell or read properly. But I could read a, a book by the picture. I've got a photographic me, 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 and I didn't realise that. But the thing was, I couldn't learn much. But I was good at art. In the children's home at five, I started to draw. And in, in the book, Rupert the Bear, have you ever read the Rupert the Bear? Yeah. And don't you think it's nice? Well, them days, it used to be a black and white, a black uh, uh, and a drawing of uh, Rupert, and the badger was black, and he had just a little red shirt on, pullover on, and a pair of trousers and shorts, and the others were there. So I used to paint in Rupert's the Bear, where they had the blank spaces of drawings of him, you know. And I really knew how to paint, although I was never taught not to go over the lines and put the colours in what you think is right, you know what I mean? So I became one of the, the best dry, uh, drawers. And then when I went back to the children's home at night time, I even played with plasticine and made sculptures for farms. And also we had match store sticks. Now you could buy them in a bag when you buy toys from a toy shop, them days. So you get no matches on them just the sticks themselves for the manufacturer. So I made a house, farmhouse, you know? And the things you could do, and we had soldiers, and we had lead soldiers, and of course everybody said, you mustn't have them there. They didn't do any harm. They were really beautiful, they were lovely and painted. But and then we also, at the school, they had parties and plays as well, and in the parks and sports, very good, happy times. And you're jumping over the girls' backs all day, jumping over yours, you know. And it'd be naughty, really, because sometimes when they were, their knickers used to be rolled, their frocks used to be rolled up in the knickers, you know. <laughs> we used to see the knickers, of it, you know, but it was all in fun, really, you know. You could imagine the boys taking it out of them, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what happened when the war started? That was very sad, in a way, because everybody got to be took out of the homes because we were right by the airdrome, only half a mile away, and the village was next to it. And the point was, all the school 
and all the children in the village had to be moved down because of the bombing coming, especially through the airport there, and they probably may bomb, bomb the village. But the point was, they had to find homes for them, so they had to be evacuated. Now, because my mother was alive in the workhouse, they approached her to have my, me and my brothers, two brothers as well, taken out the work, out the school and the workhouse children's home and be brought to Birmingham. So they had to have a meeting at the workhouse, the mother and the, the workhouse management, and I was still in the home waiting to go. And they put me upstairs, up into my bedroom, because I wouldn't stop crying, because I never said goodbye to the children that was in my, in my, my house cottage, you know. It was so sad that I actually cried all the time there, and then a the taxi come to take me up to the workhouse. And then they drove me from the workhouse. My mother signed to go there. The saddest thing they said to my mother, you go now, mother, but don't you ever come back. It's so sad to say that to her. And I sat there, my two brothers, and I never forgot that. Seeing this morgy but a green wall and a yellow top with a square like a brickwork, where they're coming for their interviews when they go into the workhouse, that we left there, got into a taxi, and we was taken straight out. She had a couple of people standing outside to say goodbye to mother as they waved. And then the next thing, we had to pass the school. And I burst out crying because I couldn't say goodbye to them. And I could hear them singing in the classes as we had the windows opening. Because it was one of the hottest summers in the year. So we was on our way to Birmingham. Now this is a funny really because it was an old 1924... Um, uh, um, 1924 all seen car and it had three to four flat tyres as we were making our journey all the way to Birmingham and of course we had to stop while he repaired and everything. How old were your brothers when you were evacuated? When, when I was evacuated, my brother, at that, 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 that age, my youngest brother was about seven or eight. My, my, I was about 11, I was 11 actually. And my brother was about 15, 14 to 15, because he was due to come out and go and could be sent to Australia or something like that. Because that's what they do with the old girls and boys, send them away and put them in services and all that. So we was on our way from there with, uh, with my brothers and that to South Yardley, Birmingham. And this lady put us up in South Yardley. And uh, she was a friend of mother's, because that's why they, she brought us to Birmingham. But mother went back into his service in Birmingham and left us with this lady. And because mother couldn't find the money to pay her, and she had her for two weeks feeding her for nothing, us three, she said took, she was so angry with my mother, she took us up to where she was in South Yardley at Mrs Newton's in service and not, left us on the pavement in a thunderstorm soaking wet and took us to the house and said to, to my mother, you can have your, your bloody kids. Now that was sad to me. And she just come straight out, plonked herself as looking at him, and Rob, you would stay in here, and just let us say it. And that was so sad. So when we got inside in service, like with the lady who had the house and owned it, where, where mother was working, she said to, uh, to us two boys, because Ray was put in the Dr. Bananos as well at that time, right to that time, because knowing that she was, he was too young to come, come along with my older brother, me and my oldest brother, and we had to get changed, get them dry before we could go, go back to a new place. Now this was in uh, Golden Hiller. Her mother knew them people. In fact, I believe she knew the taxi driver more so than anybody, because of my brother. And the thing was, within a week that we was there, We've got to be evacuated. Now I'm not to know. I'll go to school. I didn't even know any children. The first week I didn't even know the children. And uh, you just you look at a boy with a workhouse clothes. Who's that? You know, that's a sort of expression. And if they tried to take the mickey out, well, I wouldn't stand for it. But I never had anybody do that. Anyway, the next week they took me with a gas mask, took us up to the Golden Hill. It's lovely this is, really. They took us up to the Golden Hill, up to the school. And us people at Golden Hill, children at school at Baverstock, had to walk all the way down to Small East Station. And the nicest thing I never knew, although the camera was there, he photographed us all walking just into the station. And I never knew, and yet 
I could pick myself out if I saw it. And it wasn't till the war ended when I come to Birmingham, when I was in Birmingham, leaving Tamworth, that I saw my photo with them children in there. So that was really an honour. But it was so sad when we was in Moore Street Station to go into the uh, uh, railway area where we've got to get on the train. And when we went on the train, you see hundreds of children, girls and boys, and some parents going with them. And when you saw the crying and everything like that, it was so sad. But I didn't know anybody. I was what you call a complete loner in a trauma. What's going to happen to me? And it never stopped. Where were you taken? I was taken to Tamworth and Arne, but I didn't know I was going where. I, they told me to get out when they got all the ones they wanted out of Earl's Wood and Wood Inn. They got out there, and then we had going up to Tamworth and Arden Wood End Station. Now it wasn't to know that we were going to stop there and get all of us out. And when we come out we had to lie in a great big, all get into a big bunch and it was his, and one boy didn't come out. And he stayed in. So the, the bus, the train uh, driver, uh, the conductor, had to go in there and look for the other boy because one missing you see. But I stood there with a little bag with just a bit of food and lemonade in there. And all the others have got cases and everything. We're closing that, they've got nothing. And then when we left Wood End Station, we walked up to the main road, and there's two coaches there to take us down into Tamworth Village, Tamworth Arden Village. Well, the point was, they took us to the school, got out, and took us to the school. And as we were going in, a lot of mothers who were going to look after the children were waiting for these boys and girls to take back with them. I walked in and I walked right at the back of the queue in a corner and stayed there knowing that I didn't know what was going to happen to me or even the children that were there, where I was going to go or who I'm going to go with. And I stood there right to the end and there was another boy with me, John Hall. We was the last two and they got no one to take us. Now they could put John into a place but they couldn't put me in a place because I've got nowhere to go. But they couldn't send me away, and no one was there to take any of us, in the last two of us, me and that boy, John Paul. And I would remember him as well, because I lived with him, you see. And so they went and fetched a dear old lady named Mrs Tibbles, a beautiful lady. And she come, she was, I think she was about 17. That's a lot to take two boys on, isn't it? And the funny part of her is, is she looked at us, and she said to the, the, the inspector who was in charge of all the vacuums, would you have them? She said, I'll take two, beans. I was going to take one, but I'll take the two. And that look on her smile gave me a new life. That was the happiest day I ever had at that time, seeing that lady smile and held our hands and took us down to the to small cottage, which was 500 years old, and introduced me to her, her, her husband and she has got sons and everything in the wall. And the funny part about it, you have to duck your head when you go in. And the gentleman was six foot, so he always had to duck. With every door he went in, into an old fashioned cottage, you know. And the roof sloped back, so you had to duck when you go out. <laughs> so it was, it was, and then they showed you the things. He was a tailor, but they show you the things to make. Uh, what what uh, her husband makes is palm bridges. And he sits in his own working room making for the farmers, cross-legged on a chair, on a table. How would you like to sit all day doing hand sewing? Eh? <laughs> and he was also an RP, if the Germans come over bombing, because he'd hadn't started then. And he was an ARP. And uh, of course he'd be air raid warden sort of, come round and see if he liked to him. So houses had to be blacked out, so planes didn't see him. Not even a smoke or a torch was you allowed to have on, out on the roads, you know. So it started there. What did you do there? Well, I'm a bit venturous and I'll do anything for anybody. But she made me so happy, I didn't have to be asked. I would help them any, in any way. And she said to me, Frank, would you do some little bits of jobs for me? And I'll pay you 16 pence at the, six pence at the end of the week. But it wasn't the money I was up. so happy to do something. Feeding the chickens and feeding the geese and they're lovely animals really 
chickens are blooming greedy, the hens as well, you know. But then I had to feed the pig. And I used to love the pig, because pigs are like a dog, you know. You could invite them in your house, they're quite clean. <laughs> but I used to go into the sty and sit by him and give him an apple <laughs> and scratch his head, you know. And it was so lovely. And then when I fed them all, the pigs would always scream and you'd, when they could smell their food being cooked. Because we used to get all the waste food that we don't eat and some corn flour and everything and give them a lovely corn flour and the chickens the same and the geese. But they did like lettuce as well. But to say that we used to feed them with them and wartime was not ro much different. You wrote, sweets were rationed as well. And you always shared with sweets when you had them. Some of them might have one one week and they'd eat them all the next, but we shared them as we were in school and that. But the, the, it was so lovely because I used to start to make things back to my artwork again. Now the Germans used to come. We said they're coming over to bomb and everything. And if any Germans come here, we'll shoot them. Well, it was boys and girls were the nurses, and we was got wooden guns. Well, I made my own wooden guns again, wooden guns there, and with the nails on and a nail for the triggers. And then I made a tank, pulling it along with a wooden wheel, wooden wheel with the gun sticking out, you know. And then hiding in the hedges, shooting the, the boys, you know. <laughs> so it was real boys' play, and the girls with the nursing, being a nurse, and banging you up and all that sort of thing. Also, we used to go into the into the green, and the home guards come. And when they come, they were actually uh, just naive. They were learning how to be a soldier. Some might have been, but they come with forks to be a home guard. One come with a blunderbuss rifle for shooting rabbits to shoot the Germans and kill the Germans if they landed. You know. And it was quite comical because we took our cork guns and bows and arrow. And when the lorry was there and the troops got out, the Bedford lorry was, they got out to do some training. And what they had was an anti-tank gun. Now that was a real one. And we watched that from a distance, watching them how they were doing it. But that anti-tank would fire at least 100 yards and could knock out a tank. But if you did fire it and you aimed at a tank in, in wartime, you would have to run because of that. You are too near to that tank if you missed, you know. But the point is, we used to fire the cork guns at the lorries and everything. And he told us to clear off. We aggravated him more. But it was the play, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was really lovely. And where was Miss Tibble's cottage? It was just about a, uh, less than 50 yards from the school, in the centre, more or less in the centre of, of the village. And it's a lovely cottage. And there's three other cottages opposite. One was a bootman, and another one was someone, Mrs. Moore, um, uh, Mrs. Moore, and 12, I think it was 10 children she had. Two up, and then someone had to sleep downstairs as well. Only one little bath place or wash place to wash in. All them children keep, keep, keep playing. And then there was tailors and groceries. And then there was Mrs. Broom. Mrs. Broom was a friend, the boy was a friend of mine. That we lived right, quite, right by us. All these were right by each other. And then it was Mr. The Dentist, the Dentist House, we used to call it. That was a very big manor house, house that was. A lovely house he was. It was very wealthy, but that didn't matter to me. But the point is, that was the little path where I was living, so identical. Then you've got a slope, a hill. And as you walk down it, they call it, the, I think it was Tom Hill or something. Anyway, there was this, this hill we walked down to, where you can walk into the mile walk. And that tells another good story. And it's so funny. Because when you go down there, us boys and girls, we play in the streams. And we play and look for birds' nests or climb up trees, you know. But when we got in us in the streams, you take your shoes off and your socks off and paddle there. And we play and throwing stones and spinning them, you know. And you didn't hurt anyone. We didn't get hurt. The girls were the same. But then us boys, three of us, all walked further away up a stream where we wanted to make a dam. A bit naughty. <laughs> <laughs> and so we took all our clothes off, got into this, uh, was it, and built, get the mud and the building, the, the branches, and put them all up. And I always remember it ever so well. And put it all up. So we blocked that, build up, come over, over the top. And there was us just walking around trying to learn to swim. And two girls come along. 
and they start his woo, you know, and we told them to buzz off. So we picked some clay up and threw them because we've got nothing on, and they run like hell. I'm going to tell our mum, she says. And it's so funny, I met the mother later on. I'll tell you that a little bit. <laughs> it was so lovable, honestly. And what happened to John Hall? Well, he had, actually, we were sleeping in the same room. He's a good lad, good boy as well. But he wasn't very happy when he left home. And I'm afraid a lot of children were like that. Even in, elsewhere around town, where some of them went home within weeks, you know. But he, was a, he didn't look good, as though he was uh, going to make it, as a saying is, with regards adapting to the life that I've had. But he couldn't adapt to the life that was in front of him, you know, which was far better than mine. But he, he wanted to go home, so his mother had him home then. It was quite sad, really. Yeah. And uh, of course, then I was on my own, but I, I, do, I don't mind. I don't mind. And I got the, the, the other boys all round. They're all your friends. They never had any mosses with, mosses with, with me, you see. But I'll tell you something when we went to school now. When we was in the school, I wouldn't be picked on, but I wouldn't look for fights or anything else. But sometimes, some try it, you know what I mean? But I, was, I could quite handle myself, that they never wanted to have me do it again. Because I had a favourite system when I was fighting, not so much as hitting. I'd go down on the floor. Well, that's the wrong thing to do, really. But when he come down on top of me and sitting there on my stomach, I could throw him twice the boy, and that hurt him when he landed. <laughs> so they never come again, you know. But the funny part is, in, this, in the class, learning was my problem. Mr. Benson was a lovely teacher, and a good teacher, headmaster. And Mrs. Davis was a second, and then there's another one that has the children, you know. But Mr. Benson was very strict with all people, no favouritisms. But I still couldn't pick up the words. But I think a lot of the things as well, I couldn't hear properly. Because boys from workhouses had bad hearing, mm -hmm. also bad eyes. And my brother, when they gave him his glasses, you could see them as they were twice the size and they wasn't the right size. But that's what they did. In them days, doctors didn't know what other size you got. Just give them them workhouse glasses, you know. But anyway, I was on my own there. And uh, I get up to mischief. Teachers just gone out the door, looking in, you know. And of course, you get a girl. Oh, when he she, when he came back in, oh, teacher, Frank Smith been flicking water, flicking paper at me. Oh, yeah, come round to me and click me on the back of him head, you know. And he clicked this other boy as well, you know. And uh, he moaned when, when the playground. I just teach him, just took him a medicine, you know what I mean. But when I get punished, I don't hold grudges, you know. So when we was out playing, and that was the time when I hit that boy. Because I said to him, boy, when you stop behind, because I got punished, I didn't want to argue with the teacher. I deserved it. But he wanted to argue with me, because hit him hard, he didn't at all. But that was the way. But he struck me. But he didn't strike me after that, because I soon had him on the floor, covering with small with blood. And the teacher dragging him back into the school. That would teach you lessons a week, Smith, you know. But it wasn't uh, what you're more very, really, very really ambitious. But that's the sort of people not got to live with that boy. Mm. Be Mrs. Bennett's. Mm. Yeah. But uh, and another thing is, you see, having a cane. I did naughty things occasionally. Always blotched the, the pad on the arm, more ink on the pad than, the, <laughs> than in the pen. <laughs> Miss, stand out there, you'll get the cane for all this bad writing. You know. <laughs> I used to do that, pulling my arm back. Can you imagine that, having a cane? And so he said, right, grab my arm and come down with the other one. And I always said to the boys and girls, I'm going to break that cane, I'm going to break that cane. And I bloody well had to go at it as well one day. I'm going to get another cane, so I flew for it. I regret it, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I flew for him, grabbed the cane, but I forgot it's a very bent uh, bamboo. And they'll go like that and they won't break. And I finished up on the floor with him and he gave me gliding down and he did clout me a few times with his hand, you know. But I never hold a mosser the next day. No, never hold him a mosser tea. I got what I deserved. <laughs> but he had his job. Nobody would ever upset me, I'll tell you. <laughs> were you. Were you aware that the war was going on? Yes, I was, because the simple reason is, although we was in the village, only about, um, I'll say, 30, 30, 20 miles from the Maypole, King's Heath, Birmingham, right into the town, and then there was Coventry as well. So when the bombing started, I think it was Coventry, Coventry first, 
and then Birmingham as well, only minor at the time. And when the bombing started, we could hear the bangs going. But all round Tamworth, so a mile away from us, was the artillery guns. And there was a lot of shrapnel going up. Now, no one is, is dared to go outside and walk around because they were exploding from all guns from our own troops, you know. But the, they were really bombing Coventry, that you could see a slight effect in the sky of the red or, or bright light in the middle of the night. And you're in a blackout. We was underneath the table, underneath the, the, the stairs, sitting in there with dear Mrs. Tibbles and John, myself. That's why we didn't go, go back on when the, until the bombing started. But anyway, the point was, and we got a candle there and we were holding our hands to say our prayers, and I'll tell you what, this one night when they come, we went down in there several times, but this one night they dropped bombs in Tamworth. And one was only just a hundred yards from our house, but about 30 yards right by the power box that they had for all the village. And it was by the Vicarage, Vicarage Hill at the top. And it was right by these houses and the Vicarage and it exploded. Never did any harm, never no, no, knocked the house down. And then there was another one uh, up in the, in the playing field in the, by the, where we played at school, and by the haystack. And that's folly, because when we found out they bombed that, when we thought we would go up there and do some playing and footballs and everything, we saw that being bombed and all the big hole in there where the bomb landed by the haystack. So we said, we're right, we'll play soldiers. So you get up there and we'll bombard you down below. So we took a pile of clay, made a hole, and got ourselves up the top of the hairy. And the other one down, they put a barricade looking as though they were soldiers down there. And pelted the clay down. And if you got it in with all the grey on you, knew you got it in them. But they chased us out because it was, the farmer didn't like us mucking around with the old hairy. But the cows wouldn't even because he'd been there for donkeys, he'd rot in away, you know. No good to give anybody. But there was three bombs dropped around town, but three to four, I think it made one up, all the end station somewhere. But no one was killed, funny you know. And you could see them coming over to Birmingham then. The RAP was up on top of the church tower, looking out, uh, out and the home guard went up there as well, looking to see where the fire went. And the place was up in flames all around in Birmingham and Coventry, you could see as far as that. Because then you listen to the radio in the morning saying about the bombing, you know. They didn't say too much, not to let the Germans know too much, you know. But we knew we, they were going in there. But also at school, I remember we used to listen to the radio. They used to put it on board and listen to the history. Just a little short bit, just of the news. Only much, not much to the Tawadi children and grown up while we was there. But they used to listen to the history. And I loved them, you know. Because although I couldn't read, I could remember the stories. Indian, Africans and all that how they were poor and slaves. And I could remember them. I could all, sort of paint them in my brain. But if I put them down the spelling, it would be wrong. But it doesn't matter, the point is I could remember them. And another thing, if I had to do an exam, leaving, I just couldn't bear to try, because I know I'm going to fail. Before I even start, think of the brick wall, you might say. <laughs> but no one could beat me at drawing. I draw the wall posters, four or five, and kept drawing them for them. The teacher gave me the drawing pad <laughs> and the pencil and to crane them in or paint them in to do my posters, and he put them on the wall there. And there's one in the book as well. Yeah, But he put them on the, in there, my drawings. There was a sailor one, officer looking on the bridge with the binoculars, looking out to see if they could see the U-boats. That was one. And then another one, your country needs you. You know, and that's how it was going on, you know. So it was so beautiful. And uh, I could beat everybody on it, you know, because I really was good. And I was telling them, you, you're right, you might respect you a bit slightly, but not much. But for a child of my determination, I didn't have to look at a photograph. I just drew them, you know. And um, well, what happened next? It was very sad, actually, because living with Mrs Tibbles, I've been so happy all that time. But unfortunately, Mr Tibbles um, had a stroke. And I think he also got another one that you can't cure once they've got that one. But the point was, they had to move me quickly. 
and Mrs Tibbles had a breakdown. She was took into hospital at the same time, which mainly said they had to look at, get me to look after someone else. So I went to Mrs Bennett's. Now, she was a dear old lady, uh, very old fashioned. She was over 70, not, not the same as Mrs Tibbles, but good and kind, that's the most important. But she liked a cider, one bottle and all. And uh, the funny part about it was, she asked me to go and get this cider for her. And uh, oh, she treated me so well, she got one son. But I had to have a bath downstairs, caught in a tin bath. And in the winter time, it's very cold in your kitchen, it's ice cold, too cold. So you'd have a paraffin lamp, and they smell terrible, you know. So I had it by the fire. And I actually got one of the old wartime papers and put that on so it didn't splash that, and I had my bath there. And dear Mrs. Um, Bennett used to look after me, I'll get myself dry and I'll go to bed. But all of a sudden she had a stroke, and this was very sad really. I won't repeat one part. But uh, she had this stroke and she needed help. But the mother, the, father, the son, had to go to work because there's no DH money. He wouldn't be paid. So he, he wouldn't know how to feed his boy, his mother, or himself comes to that, as soon as he'd run out of food. So I helped her while she was ill, especially for the one week, to get into bed and all the things she needed and required was very sad. And go to school and come back to see if she was okay, give her a drink and do the tea and help her to the toilets and get her back in. But the point was, uh, she had to have a daughter come from London lock her house up, because her husband was in the airport, and come over with her two children, then go and live, come over to look after her mother. So that left, took the relief off me. And dear Mrs Smith was living here because her husband was in BSA, she used to stay, over, stay overnight. And she stayed there with Maureen, which is a little girl that I know quite well as well. They're living at Mrs Devil, Bennett's, you know. It's a full house really, when you've got a few people in there. But the war, they help one another. Even people abroad from the town could come in if they could get a, a nice sleep there because of the bombing in the BSA and that. Anyway, it would come to the stage, it was getting too much. And living in the same room with the boy and the girl and the mother, it was too much in the room. Naughty things going on sometimes, but I won't repeat them. But the point was, they knew that I'd have to move on because the amount of people were in there in that cottage. So I went to Mrs. Mr. Holden up at um, Aspley Heath. And Aspley Heath, I knew, of course I know the people, and Mrs Gills and all, I know the, fact, the village people all over. And uh, he was so kind, and his mother. And the day I went there was so sad. It was really. He was riding his bike to Birmingham, and he had a crash. Not that it was his fault, someone running to him. And he was rushing to the hospital with his arms there, broken arm. So he was in hospital for a week. They had it all bandaged up. And because he wasn't there, I helped his, his, his wife. I don't sure what she called Minnie, but anyway, I helped his wife, which was very good to me. And I helped to do his garden for him while it was bad. I didn't know what it was going to be like when he came back. Anyway, I'll never forget this because when he did come home, he was grateful for what I'd been doing for him. And he's still going to look after me. But he had his arm up there in a plaster. Now how the hell can you do anything with your arm stuck up there? And the funny part about it was he felt sorry for him, but he says, Frank, you've been marvellous helping me, you know. But his wife had to struggle to get his clothes on, put the jackets on and everything. But all of a sudden his wife was gonna have it. She did get better, but he had that arm in a real bad stage then when he got it down he was feeling better. But he never really got properly better all his life. But the point is she was having a baby. So that become another burden for, for them, with me being there, for, for the mother, for his wife to have a baby. So, and he already got a son. I think his name was John. And I got on very well to draw the aeroplanes for him. Yeah. And he was a lovely child. And they had a beautiful home as well, more modern than what, what they were in Tamworth in Arden, you know. A little bit more modern, but they were council houses. So when they moved me, they moved me to Mrs. Gills. <laughs> It's so funny, really. We get there again, you know. And she made me so well. She took me up to the room and put me the bits of clothes that I'd got. And they found me clothes in Tamworth, and I got none when I went there. 
but they found me these clothes to go with me, whatever I wanted. I was working on the farm for Mr. Johnson at the same time, because I left school then, you see. And I was working then, uh, just at Asper Heath, on the farm there. And I did a bit of gardening, as well as another place, down in Vickery's Road, for a very wealthy person, who worked at the BSA, funny enough, he was the director. But I was only there for a short time. But then when I was living at Asper Heath, I knew them all from up there as well. So I lived with Mrs. Gill. And so when we was having our tea, because I got there in the afternoon, and she said, this is your bed, Frank, he's coming down. We had our meals, it was time to go to bed. So I go to bed. When I went to bed, I was just about to get in and then the daughter called me. So I opened the door and she called me so when I opened the door, she said, Frank, just like that. I won't say what she did, but she had a benign gown on. I got back into my bedroom quick. <laughs> as, the, as the sister shouted, get to bed! And if she'd have seen what was happening up there, she'd have gone mad. <laughs> but anyway, I think she was a bit bloody naughty. That's naughty, naughty, you know what I mean? But anyway, the point was, the common time that I, my mother wanted me to go back home. So unfortunately, I went to live with my, my stepfather. Then. To live there, I was happy thinking I was going to see a stepfather because I had no, no father. So we come to Birmingham. And when did you go to Birmingham? When I went to Birmingham, because they, they sent a letter to say, we've got a home for you. And you've got a new stepfather. And I was happy to think that. But I'm afraid when I got there, it was not the stepfather that I was going to like. He was a very, he never had children himself. He didn't know anything about children, which is most important. I don't think he had any love for children. He didn't want me there. Really, mother had insisted I'd have it come back because what they were more interested in, me bringing in the, in the money. And when I bring in the money, I had to get another job because I couldn't go to town with another that far down there. So I got one in, in um, Earl's Wood, working there for a short time. But he kept taking my money and mother, all the wages I was earning, better than I was in town with night, and give me just a shilling a week. Now I'm a boy growing up. I used to buy myself clothes for the first time and she wouldn't give me none. She wouldn't even let me have a bath in the baths because we had no baths, only in a tin bath. But that was too much trouble. She made me have a bath in the wash tub. Can you imagine a brick wash tub and you sitting in there trying to have a bath and you've got to get out and the kitchen put on there so you're on your own having your bath like that, you know. That's how it started, the life at the beginning of coming into Birmingham. Whereabouts in Birmingham did you live? I lived in Institute Road, King's Heath. And it's a, a long road. It's very cold in the winter time, but it's a long road. And that's where I lived down the bottom part of that. It was never a happy time for me. Because I got my mother there, and I wanted to ask her a lot of questions. And when I asked them, she didn't want to tell me. She got some papers down say oh, what worth I was. I didn't know what they were. She told me to burn it, it was her marriage lines. Yes, she wouldn't tell me how old I was born properly. Born properly. Said I was born in 1927. But I was born in 1928. So that's how, that's how it started in Birmingham. But it doesn't end there. How long did you stay with your mum? A very short time, three months. It's sad to say it was three months of hell. I've been punched, hit, taking all my worried money. And when I got home, I cried in the bedroom. The bedroom I was sleeping in was just got the bed, green walls, a gas light, and no coal in the fire. The only fire they had down there. When I come home from work from the farm, at Earl's Wood, I'd have to chop the wood. Being on the farm, you work late in the summer, thrashing and everything, and hay making. And chop the wood, get the coal in, get everything ready for the following morning, get up first and light the fire. But she made me so happy because she kept knocking, uh, nagging him and nagging me because of the price of the food and everything else. If there's tomatoes or this, I didn't want to hear it, but the point was, it didn't matter if I spoke, you used to give me a clam. I could stand no more. I said, Mother, I'm going to leave you. I'm not going to stand any more of this. I cried my eyes out many times and refused to to have anything to do with him because he was nothing but a butcher as far as I was concerned. I'd never been hit by anybody 
and I've helped so many people because I'm grateful for what they've done for me and what they're doing as well, which was so important in life to have. If you've got a father like that who really looks at you, you're proud of him. But if you've got one once they beat beat you, it's not as though he's drunk, but he was cracked, he was so mean. Every penny, he would try and get it some way. He even filled the buses, not paying the the, the buses when he's going to work. He was begging for pennies on the bloody road, to my language. (laughs) Knock that off, you like. (laughs) But the point was, he'd take the money out of the church collection back as it was going around. And they said to him, don't you ever come in here again. And yet he got a marvellous voice, and when you heard him singing, it was right at the top, above everybody else. He always kept his shoes dirty and clean. The only thing he ever had shining. He wore and big for old clothes and everything, postman clothes going to work. He went to work with a bowler rat. <laughs> and at work they burned it. <laughs> they took it out of him there, you know. Oh, they had to, he had tolerated. But he was so violent with people. The neighbour next door. And the one who was gassed you in the wars too, 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 too shortly after, they all been beaten and knocked on the floor. Two neighbours was dedicated in one up the road in the bus by the bus stop. He always pushes and walks in the front of a bus stop. And he told this man to come up and he walked up to get at the back of the queue. As soon as he said to me, put him like, put him on the floor. Yeah. And they banned him from coming on the on the buses because he used to say pass the money down to the conductor, because they're conductors in day. But he would hold that back while the orders got there. And then when the conductor turned and walked away, he said, hey, you yeah, give him my blooming ticket. They made him pay, but they put him off and we had to walk all the way to the horse, didn't they? He was doing it regularly, so they caught on him, yeah. yeah.